I do want to mention that um, uh, yesterday, Roland Weir Willie passed away. Um, he is not a member of Bree Adams Church, but his family has very close ties here in our congregation, and I know many folks know Coach Weir Willie. So uh, please be praying for his family. Also, we need to pray for the family of Janice White, one of our elderly members. She passed away this morning uh, about 5 a.m., so um, we need to pray for them. Would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you and that you listen, that you carry us, especially through difficult times. We lift up the families of Roland Weir Willie and Janice White. Please strengthen them, Lord. Help them to sense your presence. We pray that they would feel your presence through us as we serve as your hands reaching out to them holding them up. Thank you, Lord. We also pray that you would speak to us. Help us to hear you. Whatever you have to say in your word, shape us, inform us, carry us farther along in you. Help us to worship you in the way we respond to your word this morning. In the mighty name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, just before he ascended back to heaven, Jesus told his disciples this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We're in a sermon series in which we're focusing on evangelism, on being witnesses for Jesus. Well, how does one do that? How can you be a witness for God? How can you tell someone about salvation? Well, before we begin to tackle these uh, difficult questions, these important questions, there's a couple of things that we probably need to clear up right from the outset. The first thing is the first note on your note sheet, and it is this. We are witnesses, not salesmen or saleswomen, as the case may be. We are witnesses, not salesmen. What do we mean by that? What's the goal of a salesman? To make the sale, to complete the sale. That's the goal. What's the goal of a witness? To testify, to just tell the story. I, I was there. Here's what I saw. Here's what I experienced. Very different goals. The reason that I'm saying this right at the start is sometimes when we start talking about sharing our faith and, and witnessing, we get all this pressure about, oh my goodness, what if the person doesn't pray to receive Jesus right there and then? What if their life doesn't change? You know, what if I mess up? What if I fail? What if I do it wrong? And I think that part of the, part of the, the thing we're missing in that kind of thinking is forgetting what our goal is. Our goal is not to complete the sale. We're not after a sale. Does that make sense? Our goal is to be a faithful witness. What does a witness do? A witness just shares what they've experienced. A salesman is only successful if he gets the customer to buy his product, only if he closes the deal. A witness is successful if he or she just tells what they've experienced. In other words, the only way to fail is to not share your experience. It's the only way you can fail. I say, but Kevin, but what if they don't get saved? What if they won't even listen when I try to share? How others respond to your story is not your responsibility. You can't control how others respond anyway. All you can control is what you choose to do, whether or not you choose to share. You're only responsible to share what you've experienced. As a matter of fact... You can't save other people anyway, even if you made it that goal. I, I want to you know, save people for Jesus. Well, you can't do that. I can't do that. We can't save people. All we can do is point them toward the one who can save them. We are partnering with God in his work. We share the story, but it is God who saves. 
I know these are real simple concepts, but I think we are so prone to forget these things. You feel all this pressure. I've got to get this person saved. No, you don't. All you've got to do is point them to the one who can save them. Jesus is the one who saves. Jesus is the Savior. Did you die for the sins of the world? Did I die for the sins of the world? Did you rise in eternal victory over death, hell, and the grave? Was that you? No? wasn't me either. There's only one Savior. And one Savior is all we need. So we serve as witnesses to the Savior. God is the one who saves. In 1 Corinthians 3, the Apostle Paul is uh, talking to the Christians there in Corinth. And the Christians there in Corinth, they had a tendency to kind of break into factions. I know our churches today don't have that problem. Uh, They had a tendency to break into factions. And what they would do is they would kind of rally behind their hero of the faith. And so they would say, you know, one of them would say, well, you know, we, we follow Paul. You know, we're Paul Christians. And others would say, well, we're, we're, we, we follow Apollos. He was another Christian evangelist in the first century. So we're Apollos Christians. And others would say, well, well, we follow Christ. You know, we're Christ Christians. And here's what Paul had to say about that. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 3. After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believed the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. Part of what Paul is getting at here is that every one of us has a role in joining God in spreading the gospel, redeeming humanity as carriers of the message, as ambassadors for Christ, as we've discussed in previous sermons, every one of us has a part to play. And the parts that we play may not all be the same. You might be a seed planter. What's a seed planter? That's a person that just gets the, gets the, the process started, the process of a person gradually coming to the point to where they're ready to receive Christ as Savior. You might be that first impression person. Your goal, or God's goal for you, the role he has for you to play is to make that incredible first impression that just gets them thinking. They may be upset. They may be irritated. They, they may not know how they're feeling, but boy, something caught their attention. Through something you said, something you did, somehow God made a first impression through you. That could be your role. Or your role could be one of those persons who comes along later and just waters that seed. Maybe that's you. And it could be you know something you say, something you do. You know, hey, I was just wondering if I could pray for you today. Is there anything you'd like me to pray about? Just, just little bits of watering that seed, nurturing that seed. God uses us in all sorts of ways. We get into trouble when we think, when I share my faith in whatever way, if that person doesn't drop to their knees and proclaim Jesus as Lord right there and then, then I've just failed. Well, you know what? Maybe that wasn't your role. There's seed planters, there's waterers, there's harvesters. Maybe you were needing to be a seed planter that day, or maybe you were needing to be a waterer. There's a fellow back in the 70s that developed something called the Ingalls Scale. And what this teacher was doing was trying to communicate that most people, it takes most people a long time to come to Jesus. And it usually, most people, it may take them five different points of contact with the gospel, or seven different points of contact, or even 20 different points of contact. And maybe you're just step four. 